This is the first Sunday of Advent here in Raleigh, North Carolina. Advent 2018. The epistle is taken from St. Paul's letter to the Catholics in Rome, chapter 13. Brother, knowing that the time that is now, knowing the time that is now, it is now the hour for us to rise from sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we believed. The night is past, and the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness, and put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and impurities, not in contention and envy, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ. The Holy Gospel. <clears throat> Taken from St. Luke chapter 21. At that time Jesus said to his disciples there, Shall be signs in the sun, and in the moon, and in the stars. And upon the earth distress of nations by reason of the confusion of the roaring of the sea and of the waves. Men withering away for fear and expectation of what shall come upon the whole world. For the powers of heaven shall be moved. And then they shall see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with great power and majesty. But when these things begin to come to pass, look up and lift up your heads, because your redemption is at hand. And he spoke to them a similitude. See the fig tree and all the trees. When they now shoot forth their fruit, you know that summer is nigh. So you also, when you shall see these things come to pass, know that the kingdom of God is at hand. Amen, I say to you, this generation shall not pass away till all things be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Thus are the words of the sacred scripture. By way of announcements, you can find the um, sermons of Father Pfeiffer, or myself, other resistance priests, and good catechisms of Father Pancras and uh, Father Poisson. You can find these on the website SSPX Marian Corps. SSPX Marian Corps, which is the kind of the representation for Our Lady of Mount Carmel. And then also another one that holds it is Catholic Truth. The website called Catholic Truth will also have sermons. And these are other avenues for, for souls. So, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in shaver and impurities, not in contention and envy, but put on our Lord Jesus Christ. When we look at the Blessed Virgin Mary, she is, she is the one foretold by Isaiah. And Isaiah is the great prophet of Advent. During all of Advent, the readings for the priests in the monasteries are all from Isaiah. Isaiah lived about 750 years before Christ. He foretold that a virgin will conceive and bear a son 750 years before it happened. And that this virgin would bear a son, and this son would be called Emmanuel, which in Hebrew means God is with us, God walking with us. And the prophet Baruch will say that Christ will hold his conversation among men. And then uh, the book of Proverbs will say, my delights, Christ will say, my delights are to be with the children of men. And he really loves to be in us, with us, live with our life. He wants to live with us. So uh, Bishop Williamson, in his great days, used to say, where does the Sacred Heart picture prefer to be? In the parlor room, which... Nobody goes to, except for maybe Christmas and Thanksgiving and Easter. The parlor room, 
Or does the picture of our Lord, the Sacred Heart, prefer to be in the kitchen, where everything takes place, and all the, the life is lived around the kitchen? And certainly our Lord loves to be where the life is lived. That's why we enthrone His Sacred Heart, but we have images in our home showing saints, showing the Blessed Mother, showing especially the crucifix, so that we're reminded daily of the great love of God. And we look at the examples of saints, St. Saint Patrick right here, the great warrior and monk and bishop, who, who in his 80s, in his 80s, was not in retirement, but was traveling through Ireland, baptizing, preaching, driving out devils, and working incredible miracles that still affect that country today. One of them being, there are no snakes in Ireland. He drove them all out. But the snakes have come back in a way, in another way, with uh, the liberals and the modernist clergy. So the saints show us that example. And the saint of all the saints is the Blessed Virgin Mary. So if any saint can show us how to walk honestly as in the day, it's our Blessed Mother. In Advent, one of the great, the two great, actually three great saints of Advent that are prominent throughout all the weeks of Advent, the four weeks, is the Blessed Virgin Mary, Isaiah the Prophet, and St. John the Baptist. So Isaiah will foretell the Virgin Mary to be Mother of God. And even among the pagan, among the pagan writings, especially Virgil, who was a poet in Rome, he says shortly about 150 years, or 200 years before Christ, that out of the high heaven there shall be a virgin, and this virgin shall bring forth a son. So the whole world was expecting this. And even, even in the time when the Virgin Mary was alive, there were many mothers hoping to be the mother of the Messiah. And Our Lady, since she, since she made the vow of virginity, and so did St. Joseph as a young man, they, they consecrated their life to God and made that sacrifice of virginity and chastity in order to hasten, to hurry up that hour when God will become man. So the Virgin Mary never expected she'd be the one chosen. But she, her whole life and her whole heart and her whole mind was absorbed always in, in God, in doing the will of God. So right from the moment when the angel would come to the Virgin Mary and break the news to her, break the news to her, uh, this angel will sound the silent but strong, clear trumpet that the time of redemption is, is, is near, is now, is right now. He comes to the Virgin Mary at the Annunciation. He salutes her, Ave Maria. Ave. And it's written in scriptures, Ave. Of course, that's the Latin word for basically, hello. Hi. Uh, it's, a, it's a salutation. But the fathers of the church see in it something much deeper. Because Ave, if you spell it backwards, is Eva. Eva is our first mother, created from the rib of Adam on the sixth day of creation. So, Eva brought death by dialoguing with the, with the devil. But, but put backwards and putting everything back in order is the, the greeting Ave. And Ave to who? Maria. Maria will be, Mary will be, the second Eve. Who, will, who by conversing with the angel, uh, a good angel, St. Gabriel, she will bring not death to the human race, but, but restore the life to the human race, by the grace of God, by sanctifying grace, by the redemption on the cross. So, from the very first moment when God becomes man, when the Virgin Mary says, Fiat Miki, let it be done unto me according to thy word, at that moment, our Lord God the Son, who for all eternity lives in eternal happiness with the Father and the Holy Ghost, never having a beginning, and know they're, they're co-equal, they're co-eternal, they're co-omniscient, they're co-powerful, 
and from all eternity. The sun, at that moment, comes down and is conceived by the power of the Holy Ghost in the womb of the Virgin Mary. And she's, one of her questions is, how can this be since I don't know man? How can I be mother of God since I made a vow of chastity, of virginity? How can I be a mother because I'm a virgin and I consecrated myself to God? And the angel says, don't fear. What seems impossible with men is not impossible with God. For him, for him all things are possible. So what God does is suspend the laws of nature. A virgin can never be a mother. But in this case, for his mother, he makes this virgin a mother. And not by any relation with man, but by the power of the Holy Ghost. And that's why she is foretold in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 44, verse 1. He speaks of this garden enclosed, and there's no doors to this garden. They're all, it's all walls. No one, no man, it says specifically, no man can enter in. But inside this garden is beauty. And the, the best fruits, the best flowers. And who is this walled garden that no man enters in? The Virgin Mary. Foretold already by Ezekiel. Six, seven hundred years before Christ also. Defending the virginity of Mary. And that's why on the icons, the Virgin Mary is often pictured with the star on her left shoulder, showing she's virgin before the conception and birth of Christ. On her forehead, it shows she's virgin during the pregnancy of Christ. And a, a, a star on her right shoulder that shows she's virgin after, also. And she always stayed virgin. Always, because the Protestants will say she had other children. Because, see, the Bible says the, the brethren of Christ, James and Jude, and Thaddeus. And, but they misinterpret the Scripture. As St. Peter says, many interpret the Scripture to their own destruction. They misinterpret it. And we don't read the Bible according to our own opinion. That's dangerous. That's, that's the exaltation of private judgment that, that uh, Martin Luther said. But we read the scriptures in the light and according to the apostles and who they taught. And who did the apostles teach? Were well, the fathers of the church. By the, or the living oral tradition that was passed down. And some things were written. But the Bible did not exist until the year 399. 400, 400 years after Christ. So not everybody had a Bible to read, but they all believed and all knew these truths because of the oral tradition. So the Virgin Mary, as Isaiah the prophet will, will foretold in Ezekiel and even in the Psalms, she will be virgin and mother. Virgin and mother. So the very first moment of God becoming man involves the Virgin Mary. Directly. So St. Louis de Montfort says, God who became man through her, the Virgin Mary, He chose to come to us through her. He wants us to come to Him through her. And this is another modern error. You hear this a lot among so-called Christians who say that um, the Virgin Mary is not to be Forget her, we go directly to Christ. Forget the Virgin Mary, we go directly to Christ. He is the mediator. And in some ways, of course, that's true. The Virgin Mary herself will say, I'm nothing. I'm only the, the channel, the, the handmaid of the Lord. And Christ truly is the mediator. But it's Christ, it's God who wants His mother honored. He's the one that says in the fourth commandment, honor your father and mother. We're all commanded to do this. Does he exempt himself from this commandment? No. In fact, he sets us the example. He honors his mother more than any of us honor our own mother. Because she becomes, she is never touched by sin. She's a virgin and a mother at the same time, which is miraculous. And she's exalted above all the angels as mother of God. 
So Christ wants us to go to Him through her. And it says also, Christ Himself said, What God has put together, let no man put asunder. This is the words applied, obviously, to marriage. But Christ would apply these same words to him, Himself and His mother. Because every step of the redemption, you find the two are together, always. And now, even right now in heaven, in the glory of heaven, Christ sits at the right hand of the Father. But who sits at the right hand of Christ? Like Solomon had his mother exalted and crowned and sat right next to him on his right side. This foreshadows the honor that Christ gives now, right now in heaven, to his blessed mother. And when he comes here on the altar very soon in the sacrifice of the Mass, the priest says the exact words of Christ. By the power of the Holy Ghost, the fire from heaven comes down, the bread and the wine are changed into the very living body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ. The heart of Jesus is here, very soon at the consecration. And you're going to receive him. But guess who's also there? Always the Blessed Mother. She stands next to the priest. She stands at the foot of the cross, which we're going to be kneeling before very soon. That's the Mass. So, at the very moment when Mary said, Fiat Miki, be it done unto me according to thy word, which is the most perfect prayer, by the way, she in immediately became the first cathedral of the first priestly ordination of the eternal high priest. She's the cathedral without any sin. And she's the most beautiful cathedral ever built by God. And that's the Virgin Mary. And the ordination that takes place is Christ in her womb. Because when God becomes man, he becomes our Lord Jesus Christ. God in the flesh is our Lord Jesus Christ. Who did he take flesh from? The blood of Mary. In her, in her cathedral. And he was incarnate. God became incarnate. At that moment, many things happened. And Venerable Mary of Agreda says, millions of angels were surrounding Nazareth at the time, adoring this incredible mystery that God would become man. And the angels knew this already since the first day of creation. Day one of creation. Because it says, in the beginning God created heaven and earth. And, and light was made. And many of the fathers of the church say, that light that was made was the creation of the angels. And the angels, once they were created, they immediately saw why they were here, why they were made, and they immediately saw their option, which was, in the future, a virgin would be, become a mother and God would become man. And that's when Lucifer revolted and said, I will not bow down to a piece of clay, even if he is God. I will not bow down to a lower species, way lower than the angels, and that's man. I will not serve. I will not bow down before him. And a third of the angels immediately revolted. And the sin was a sin of naturalism. I don't need God's grace for a higher happiness. Because the angels were not yet created in the vision of the Blessed Trinity. We think they were by mistake. But that's, a, that's false. They were not created yet in the vision of the Blessed Trinity. They, they had to prove and show they loved God. And bow down to the fact that God would become man someday. So this moment happened at, on, on March 25th. March 25th. The year 1 when Christ was conceived by the power of the Holy Ghost in her womb. It's also at that moment he was ordained a priest. The hypostatic union, this is called. It's a big word, hypostatic union. But it's a very simple meaning. It means God became flesh. And the humanity of Jesus Christ, his human soul, his human body, became drenched, soaked in the divinity. The images from the Old Testament is when the high priest would take oil, consecrated, and pour it over the beard and the head of Aaron, who was chosen to be priest by God. And the oil poured out over his head by Moses 
it was a lot of oil, so it soaked down his eyebrows, his hair, and dripped down to his beard and all over his, his whole body, over his bare chest and back. Everything was soaked in the oil. So that image prefigures the hypostatic union, that the humanity of Christ, the real eternal high priest, would be soaked, poured out with the oil of, of gladness, the oil of, of joyfulness, which is God united to the human nature. And at that moment, Christ becomes king. Jesus Christ, as man, is elevated as king over all the angels and all the human race. At that very moment, in March 25th, in Nazareth, that house is sacred. It's called the House of Loretto. And it was actually carried to rescue it from the Muslim destroyers. It was carried by angels. And it's a, it's a, it's a house, not just of a few you know, pieces of board. It's a house made of rock. It's heavy. Several tons at least. And the angels picked it up and carried it. First, I think, to Albania. And then when the Muslims sat there, they carried the, the house to, um, in, the, in, the, in the area of Rome in Italy. And it still stands there, as the angels placed it right in the middle of a street. And you don't build a house in the middle of a street. And that's one of the proofs against the scoffers and modernists who try to say, well, the, 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 the knights of the Middle Ages... Uh, dismount, dismantled it, brought it by ship, and rebuilt it around Rome. No way. It was le placed right in the middle of the street. In fact, one of the corners hangs over a curb of ancient cobblestones built by the Romans many centuries before. So that house is sacred because the cathedral chosen by God, which will never be destroyed, and always beautiful, the Virgin Mary, is mother of God. So, everywhere you touch Christ's life, you always find the Virgin Mary. It's kind of very similar to St. Monica and St. Augustine. St. Augustine, wherever he went, his mother was always there. <laughs> of course, she loved her son, and her son was wayward. But, that was, but she loved her son everywhere during his life. Until she died, there was St. Monica. So if that's the case of a mother for her sinful son, how much more the mother of God loved her divine son. And, and then the moment of his, the, the, the time of her carrying, there's actually a mass in the Missal honoring, a votive mass honoring the pregnancy of the Virgin Mary during the time of her carrying Christ. And for women, that's a sacred time when they're with child, that nine months, it's so important that mothers draw close to the Virgin Mary at that time and start consecrating all their children and all that, that, the future of that child she carries to the Virgin Mary as she carried the living God in her womb for nine months. And Christ in her womb had the full use of reason. From her womb, he was always seeing the Father and the Holy Ghost. From her womb, Christ was governing commanding the angels who govern the stars and the movement of the planets, etc., etc. Every bird, every insect, in the, every fish in the bottom of the sea, Christ, from her womb, was patrolling everything, governing everything. So for nine months, Our Lady carried the living God. She, she was truly the Ark of the Covenant, Remember in the Old Testament how many chapters are devoted to the Ark of the Covenant carried by, uh, by the Israelites. And this Ark was, I think, 30 feet long. The, wing, the wingspan of the cherubim, the angels on it, were of gold. And in the middle there was the box and the propitiatory seat on it where God manifested His presence. What was inside the Ark of the Covenant? The, the Ten Commandments, the stone tablets... The, the manna, the, where uh, had the vessel of the bread that God fed the Israelites in the desert for 40 years with. The manna from heaven was in there also, a vessel holding it. And then the rod of Aaron, his priesthood. So all these things prefigured Christ. And the ark itself, which was 
um, gilded and perfect, pure gold, prefigures the Virgin Mary. She is the ark that carries the true law of God, the living law of God, the eternal law of God, which is Christ himself, since he's the wisdom of the Father. She carries the living bread that has come down from heaven, Jesus Christ, who will say, after his 30th year, I am the living bread that has come down from heaven. Not as your fathers ate manna, and they died, but whoever eats this flesh will live forever. And then the priesthood of Aaron, prefiguring Christ, the true priest, the eternal high priest, whose great prayer will be the Mass. And that's why God is not pleased by the new Mass. He's not pleased by the, the false worship of, 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 of those who don't pray this Mass. God wants the Mass. Because what is the most beautiful prayer? The one that moves like sweet odor of incense to Jacob. Uh, Jacob having the, perf the cologne that his mother gave him uh, to get the blessing from his father Isaac. And Isaac smelled that, that cologne. And he says, you, 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 I will give you the blessing. You, your, your odor is sweet to me. But this prefigures God, who smells that sweet odor of the love of His Divine Son, like incense at the High Mass, which is Christ. The sweet odor of Christ offering His life for us on the cross. That's what it is. Everything in the Old Testament points to the Virgin Mary and our Lord Jesus Christ. Everything. Every detail. Even in the second day of creation, God made the seas and poured everything in it. All, all the treasures in, into the seas and then put a boundary between land and sea on the second day of creation. But what is sea in Latin? It's Maria. M-A-R-I-A, -A, in the plural, neuter plural, Maria. So God filled, poured all his graces into the Virgin Mary. And she will be the sea, deep as the sea will be her sorrows on the foot of the cross. So the Virgin Mary, Christmas night, and this is the Advent time. And remember, don't forget, coming up very soon is Our Lady of Guadalupe. And she appeared on December 12, 1531, to Juan Diego. And she calls him Juanito, which means my little Johnny. It's a funny, a very touching detail. And the mother says to Juanito, don't worry, your uncle who's very sick, he'll be fine, he'll be cured. And then she, could, she says these very touching words of a mother. Don't you know I'm your mother? Do you have any worries? Give them to me, and I, and I will take care of them. I hold you like a mother holds a child in the, in the folds of her mantle, she says to him. But she asks that a church be built. But anyway, that's another story, and that would be another hour to the sermon, so I won't go there, <laughs> even though my flight is tonight. So I could. Um, but, uh, <laughs> so... The Virgin Mary in Guadalupe, the interesting about that image is she's with child. She appears as if she's pregnant on December 12, 1531. And the, the Aztecs know that because she's carrying around her waist the black ribbon that tells you a mother was expecting. But anyway, that whole image is miraculous and very beautiful and, and still is supple and speaks to our modern age. Remember when Mexico passed the abortion law in 2006 it was the whole day on that image a baby in the womb of the Virgin Mary shined all day long out of her womb. People took photographs, they could film it, they knew it wasn't reflection of the glass because it shined in any angle you took, it was shining there. And it was the shape of a little baby in the mother's womb. Because our Lord and our Lady were protesting against Mexico's great sin of passing that abortion law. Killing so many babies. So, then December 25th, which is the day of Christmas, 
It's the day of Christmas. So many modernists and so-called theologians attack the day of Christmas. How do we know it's December 25th? Well, why did, why did St. Joseph and Our Lady go to Bethlehem in the first place? Why? The scripture says because the emperor of Rome called the census. They were there to sign their names in. They had to go to the city of their birth. Where was Joseph born? Bethlehem. That's where he had to go. So, and Mary, the Virgin Mary, was also of the tribe of David, the royal lineage, a monarchical race, and she'd be the mother of the king. So, they go to Bethlehem. Those records were kept by the Romans. They were sent to Rome. And when Rome, 300 years later, would become Catholic under Constantine, you don't think those Catholics then went into the records of Rome, the archives, and looked up, yep, yeah, there it is, December 25th. December 25th. It wasn't new to them, because they already believed and celebrated Christmas every 20th, December 25th anyway. But the records of Rome just confirmed everything. So our Lord would be born of the Virgin Mary on December 25th. And... Uh, not to go into any details of the medical side of child labor and childbirth, but I do understand that there's a lot of fluid that flows out and it can be messy. But this didn't happen with Our Lady. There was no breaking, there was no um, staining or taking away her virginity, even physically. Christ did not pass through the normal channel. He passed miraculously through the womb of the Virgin Mary. And she was surrounded by millions of angels and a, a bright light. As St. Joseph was put to sleep, he fell asleep. And all this mirac miraculous birth. And the birth was one of joy. It was one of ecstasy. And some of these Protestant films show Our Lady screaming in pain. That's false. She was, there was no pain with the birth of Our Lord. And he passed through the walls of her womb... Just like at the resurrection, you would pass through the walls of, of the cynical without going through the door. And he would not go through the normal door, but through the womb of the Virgin Mary. And so, and then Our Lady nurses the child Jesus. She holds the, she loves this child, who is God. The angels sing this. The shepherds come. We're getting ready for this with Advent, by some penance there, during this Advent. And a prayer, extra prayer. Try to pray your rosary more devoutly. Try to spend every day some spiritual reading. Offer every day some little penance to God. Give up a little dessert. Do extra without being asked to clean the toilet, scrub the bathroom. Do extra cleaning around the house or outside, shoveling dirt or whatever, raking. Now, you don't have to shovel snow down here in North Carolina, I don't think, but... Uh, do extra as penance. Give it all to God. Do everything. Give a little extra penance during this time. How we need it. It used to be a time like Lent, Advent. But that's kind of been relaxed over the centuries. And then our Lord will grow up in the... In, but it won't be a peaceful... It won't be a peaceful ride. Thirteen days after Christ's birth, this huge procession of camels, kings, servants, some say up to 150, were in the entourage of the three kings. And, and then shortly after that, the massacre of the innocents. And then St. Joseph is told by Our Lady, we've got to flee to Egypt. So it's a rough start. And then eight days after Christ's birth, there's the normal circumcision, the first bloodletting, and our Lord doesn't cry. He offers his suffering to God to, with, for the love of souls. Then 40 days after he's taken to the temple, you have the prophecy of Simeon and Anna. So the first days of Christ's birth, it is not peaceful. And then they got to travel on foot 500 miles to Egypt. And then they're in Egypt as nomads for two years. And then the Virgin Mary, all this time, the heart of Jesus and Mary, they already speak to each other. Christ doesn't speak yet. 
because he follows the laws of nature. But in their eyes and in their uh, embraces, you have a, a love that can never be comprehended. The love of Christ for his mother, the love of mother for, for her divine son. And then as our Lord, after Egypt, they come back to Nazareth, and then they have a sort of peaceful life for up to, to the 30th year of our Lord's life. But don't forget, every year, the Holy Family, like all the Jews, made a trip back to, Beth to Jerusalem every year for Passover. All the Jews had to do this. And sometimes for other feasts as well. So there's an estimate that Our Lady has walked on foot, Easily over, I forget, 20,000 miles. But the average woman would have walked a lot anyway in those days, and man. Our Lord, it is estimated, he walked up to, what is it? Uh, easily over nine, nine to 10,000 miles on foot. Um, but anyway, uh, the, the, so the silence of Nazareth, the monastery of Nazareth, with St. Joseph as, as the abbot, and then the first tasting of, of a great sorrow was the death of St. Joseph. A great sorrow, but a great joy also for Our Lady. And our Lord is there. That's why we pray to St. Joseph for a happy death. Because he died with Christ, the Sacred Heart, next to him. And Christ is a man now. He's, he was about 26, 27 years old. And the Blessed Virgin Mary next to him. So he's the patron of a happy death. And then the first miracle that sets the tone for our Lord's walk to Calvary. The walk to Calvary began really, of course, with his birth. But more practically speaking, it began with the first miracle, the wedding of Cana. But how does the wedding, how does this miracle take place? Who asked for it? The Blessed Virgin Mary. What does Christ say, woman? This, my hour has not yet come. So there's several times when our Lord addresses His mother as woman. And there's several times when our Lord seems to treat her without the affection and importance that He really gives her. It looks like He's not giving her that importance, but in fact He is. And I'll give you some examples. First, Cana. He calls her woman. My hour has not yet come. In other words, don't you know if I work this miracle, this begins the path to the bloody way of the cross. And Our Lady, out of her charity, she's accepting it. And she says to the waiters, do what he tells you. Because she has full confidence he won't let this couple and their families be embarrassed. So he works that miracle. 153 gallons of the best wine by the power of his word the same power by which he created heaven and earth on the first day land and the separation on the second day the plants, trees and, um, and fruit trees on the third day every, and, on the, and the fourth day he creates the sun, the galaxies the planets and the stars how? By the power of His Word. So it's the same power of His Word that works these miracles all throughout the whole life of our Lord. And it's the same power of His Word that's going to work the miracle of transubstantiation very soon on the altar. Christ is God, and the Word is powerful. And He is that Word, the Logos, the Verbum. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was God. He is God. That's so why we adore Jesus Christ as God. So, the, another time is when the crowds are, our Lord has just finished preaching. The crowds are pressing in and say, look, your mother and your brethren, that is his cousins, St. James and St. Jude, and the apostles are here to see you. Then our Lord says, finishing his sermon, who is my mother, who is my brother, who is my sister? And he says, he who does the will of my father, they are my brother, my mother, my sister. So what does all that mean? And the fathers of the church say, it looks like our Lord is saying, well, my, my mother is no big deal. Whoever does the will of, my, of God, my father, he's better. But in fact, study the words. 
who does the will of my father, he is my mother, brother and sister. And who of the whole human race did perfectly the will of God, never committing the slightest imperfection or venial sin, certainly never a mortal sin. Who? The Blessed Virgin Mary. So in fact, he's praising his mother in a quiet way. And then another time, our Lord has finished a sermon. A woman from the crowd speaks up and says, basically, your mother must be incredible. Blessed, are the, blessed is the womb that gave you birth, and the, when you were nursed, how great must be she who nursed you. So she's praising Christ and his mother. But then what does he say? Queen Nemo, he says, rather, uh, Beati, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. So many false Christians will say, see, he doesn't want honor to the Virgin Mary, he doesn't want uh, tribute to his mother. But in fact, St. Bruno says, no way. Study the words. See what the fathers of the church say. What is going on here? He says, don't praise my mother just because she gives birth and can nurse. Any mother can do that. There are many mothers in hell who have done that. But praise my mother because she, more than anyone in the human race, has done the will of God and lived it, kept it in her heart. And that's, he, he honors his mother. And then, of course, the greatest honor he will give her is to share in his great passion. And she did. Blessed Mary the Greatest says that Our Lady went through the agony, the scourging, the crowning with thorns. She suffered with him. And in a way, mothers can suffer more because they suffer in their heart. And our Lord, Our Lady has appeared many times with seven swords in her heart, the seven great swords. And most of them were given at the Passion. So she heard the scourging. She heard the crowning and the mockery, the crowning of thorns. She saw the bloodstains and her heart bled. And she followed him all the way on the way of the cross. And our Lord was tired, thirsty, because he bled a lot. He bled a lot. And when you bleed a lot, you, you get very thirsty. And she comes to the foot of the cross. She sees him nailed to the tree. She doesn't hear a word. The other two who are being tied to the cross, they're cursing, swearing, kicking at the Roman guards, trying to punch them. It takes several of them, five guards, to tie them down, hold them down, pin them down, step on their chest like a wrestling match. But with the, this lamb, as Isaiah would say, a lamb who ordered, opened not his mouth before the slaughter, Christ willingly lays on the cross, willingly extends his arms. He's not cussing, swearing, and the guards are like, are like, look, this man is mangled to pieces, and it's like he wants to be crucified. And he does. And Our Lady hears the pounding of the nails. She hears the whistling of Our Lord, whistling in air and out on the cross for three hours. That had to be very painful for that mother. To hear her divine son suffocating on the cross. That's the position of crucifixion. Bleeding, suffocating. And any mother seeing her own son drowning would, would crush her heart. But it's a, he's in a drowning state in his blood for three hours. And then the great words of our Lord. And then he gives his mother to St. John. Son, behold thy mother. Woman, behold thy son. So he gives us Mary as our mother. So, and then Christ dies on the cross. Who is there? Who is there to receive his dead body in her arms? And wash that dead body as best as it can be, because it's, every bit of it is mangled from the bottom of the feet to the top of the head. Every piece of his skin is ripped open. 
And who washes that with her tears that flowed out like a river? The Blessed Mother. Deep as the sea is thy sorrow, O da virgin daughter Sion. Who can console thee? Says Jer Jeremiah in his Lamentations. Speaking in the future, 600 years before, of Our Lady at the foot of the cross. And then who will be there just to, to watch him and carry him, to escort him to the burial? Not too far away, actually. It would be from here to the other side of the field here, where the cathedral is built in Jerusalem. And who will, who will bury him? Who will wrap him in the shroud that will be hanging to, today as a proof for us, our modern age, that this is Christ's resurrected body and crucified? And who will be there during the three days of agonizing? And who will be there at the resurrection? Christ will appear first to his mother, three o'clock in the morning, Easter Sunday. And who will be there during those forty days with the apostles? She became mother of the apostles, the Virgin Mary. Who will be there at the ascension of Christ, forty days after? After Christ embraces and kisses his mother and gives them all a blessing, he goes, by his own power, rises, by his own divine power. How impressive that had to be to see a physical body actually just rising of our Lord, rising until it became a tiny speck in the sky. And then the angels come and say, get busy, don't be standing here all day looking up. As you see him go, so he'll come at the end of the world. And then the Virgin Mary becomes mother of St. Peter and the Apostles. They, they call her mother. And they're going to be gathering every year for Easter time. They will gather every year to be with her. And then St. John will take care of her. And then the Virgin Mary, at the age of, I think, 63, if I'm not mistaken, she will pass into what's called the Dormition of Our Lady, a death but that is more like a sweet sleep. To, to be close to her son, she, she wants to go through death as well. She doesn't have to, she never sinned. But she suffers a kind of sleeping dormition. And her body is carried up by the angels at the ascension and reunited to her soul. And now she reigns as our heavenly queen. And she's appeared how many thousands of times to so many saints. St. Gertrude, St. Bernadette. St. Anthony, St. John Vianney, so many times has she appeared. Knock in Ireland, La Salette, Fatima. And when she appeared on the tree at Fatima, the branches actually moved. And, and Sister Lucia and her family used to keep a branch in their house as a, as a relic. And the Freemasons, of course, would come shortly after and chop down that tree and burn it. That shows their hatred of Our Lady. So, everywhere you touch Our Lord's life is Our Lady. Everywhere, every step, even in the prophecies, and even now in heaven. So, the two hearts cannot be separated. What God has joined together, no man can put asunder. No Protestant, no heretic, no Baptist, no Evangelical, no Mormon, no Buddha. You cannot separate the heart of Jesus and Mary. And when Our Lady appeared to St. Catherine of, Sia, of uh, La Barre, whose body is incorrupt right now in France, you can go see her, she looks like she's sleeping. St. Catherine La Barre, the miraculous medal that Our Lady asked to be impressed on, on a medal. What does it look like? You have the Virgin Mary in the front. And all the graces coming by down through her hands. She's the Virgin of the Apocalypse with the twelve stars. And she's the virgin of Genesis. That's why I called, call, our Lord called her woman. Because the prophecy in Genesis, I will put enmity between thee, the serpent, and the woman. And you will lie and wait for her heel, and she shall crush thy head. That's the woman Christ addressed. When he called her woman, that's who he's indicating. She is the noble, sublime, elevated woman of the Genesis. That's why he honors her as woman. And then, the, and then on the reverse, she's crushing, on, she's stepping on the serpent on the, on the front of the miraculous medal. On the reverse side, uh, no, on the reverse you've got the twelve stars, rather. And also you've got the cross, 
and the M. What is that? And the two hearts. Jesus on the cross, the Virgin Mary at the foot of the cross, always, and the heart of Jesus and Mary always beating, always together. That's the beauty of the Holy Catholic faith. The always, always the honor given to the Virgin Mary. And, and we don't, obviously, we don't adore her as God. She'd be the first to repel that. But we honor her as Mother of God, because Christ is God, Mary is the Mother of Christ. Mary is the Mother of God. And that's always been, she's, she's the bulwark against all heresies and error, the Virgin Mary. Those who attack her, fall into heresy and error. Those who don't love her, fall into sin, vices of sin, and end up most likely in hell, unless she snatches them. But those who are devoted to her, she brings them closer and closer to her son, and they do get to heaven. Melanie, the seer at La Salette, she said, there's no one in hell right now who was ever devoted to the Virgin Mary and loved her deeply. Nobody. Won't happen. So that's our key. Be, let's, let's make this Holy Advent in union with her, her heart. And pray the rosary through her eyes. See our Lord's life through her eyes. Live our life in union with the Immaculate Heart of Mary out of love for God. That all we do would be that, with that pure intention for the love of God in reparation for sins. My sins, the sins of the whole world. Our own sins. We've got to make reparation. And Our Lady said, Many go to hell because so few pray in dependence for other souls. So have that spirit of reparation, that spirit of, of uh, saving souls from hell. And think of our poor modern times, these apostate days, the state of the church, the scandal of Pope Francis, the scandal of these spineless jellyfish bishops, and so many priests leading souls to hell who will not teach the Catholic faith of tradition, who, who say a new Mass that's man-centered instead of God-centered. And this is our fight now. And this is why it's a great privilege for any of us to profess the Catholic faith and to live in the state of grace. And these days is such a grace. But that light is meant to spread, so spread it. Bring souls to our Lord and at least pray for them and make reparation for them. So let's ask the Virgin Mary to hasten the hour of her victory. She, had, she did an, an incredible victory in Mexico in 1531. And she's preparing one, another one, for our time. But this one won't be just be Mexico, this one will be the whole world that will witness the power and victory of the Virgin Mary. But it will be when the Pope obeys the Mother of God. When will that day come? I don't know. It's very tempting to just go to Rome <laughs> and uh, bring a squat team and then uh, force him to make the consecration. But we got to pray for that and keep praying for it. And also pray for our 14 seminarians at the seminary in, uh, in Kentucky. These young men who are some couple there to be brothers, most to be priests. Pray for them to persevere. If there's anything the devil does not want now, it's priests. Because the priest and the Virgin Mary are also close. Like the heart of Jesus and Mary are close, the priest and the Virgin Mary are close. It's the priest, why is he chaste? Why is he not married to a beautiful woman? Because he's married to a more beautiful woman. Far more beautiful. And that's the Virgin Mary. And as the Virgin Mary, by her words, brought down God from heaven to her womb, so the priest, like the Virgin Mary, says the words of Christ and brings down God from heaven to the altar. And that's why Archbishop Lefebvre said, the priest, this is the deepest reason why he is chaste. He strives always to be chaste in his mind, in his thoughts, in his heart. So pray for our future priests, if God wills. Pray that God make clear, answers clearly, with no doubts and no question marks, what bishop is to be the one to take care of them, to ordain them. 
And this is, we ask this, this great grace to Our Lady, through her Immaculate Heart. O Mary conceived without sin. O Mary conceived without sin. O Mary conceived without sin. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen.